Good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study on Thursday nights. We're going through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And tonight we are really looking forward to partaking together of communion. And I cannot think of anything I would rather be doing than this tonight with you. And those of you online at this time, you might want to get the communion elements ready. At the conclusion of our Bible study tonight, we are going to partake together of the communion table. And what a great night to have communion, because we're also going to start in the book of the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs. So last week we completed our study through Ecclesiastes. We're going to start in the Song of Solomon, and um, a very interesting book in the Bible. Uh, in some ways it could, why are you laughing already? We haven't even started. <laughs> uh, in some ways it can be considered a controversial uh, book in the Bible. Rabbis would not allow the young Jewish uh, men and women to read this book until they were like 30 years of age, which will be the age that I'll, if the Lord tarries, allow my daughter to start dating. I was thinking about 30, 35, something like that. But um, uh, interesting book uh, for those of you who know about this book or who read ahead to stay ahead, you know what's in this book. Uh, it's a multifaceted book in the sense that it can be read as a love song between Solomon and his bride, and or a love song between Jesus and his bride. So I spent some time really preparing in anticipation of starting this book tonight, seeking the Lord about how He would have me to teach this book. And I did make the decision as I sense the Lord led me in this direction to teach this as a love song, a love letter, if you prefer, concerning the love that Jesus has for us as His bride, and conversely, the love that we have for Jesus as His bride. Now, in so doing, I in no way wish to turn away from the unashamed intimacy that is expressed within the pages of this book. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, quite frankly, this is a book about sex and the sexual relationship uh, within the context of the marriage relationship. And I say it that way because sadly, God created sex, but Satan perverted sex. And I think it's kind of sad because in a way we've thrown out the proverbial baby with the bathwater, for lack of a better metaphor. And Satan in large measure has succeeded in marring, ruining, spoiling, perverting, that which God created to be so beautiful, so special, and so amazing. So I'm not going to turn away, I'm not going to shy away from it. That's not to say that I'm going to in any way be inappropriate. <laughs> I'll, well, I should qualify that. I'll do my best. I mean, right out of the shoot tonight, chapter one is going to get a little bit interesting. A couple of verses, we'll have to talk about this. But um, I do uh, very much look forward to teaching through this book, and I trust that it will be a blessing to you, an encouragement to you. And it is my hope, especially tonight, as we're going to partake together of communion together, that it will serve as a much needed reminder of the importance of intimacy with God intimacy with Jesus, communion with Jesus. When we get to the communion table, I want to talk 
about, especially in this time in which we are living. I'll tell you, the communion table is a reminder. It's a memorial. It's a commemoration, a celebration of what Jesus did for us, in that Jesus died for us, and He's coming back for us. And it is so easy, if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, to get caught up in the cares and the affairs of this life, especially with what's going on now on the heels of the election on Tuesday. And I just, it, and we're going to see it here tonight in chapter one. Uh, it's, it's that just getting alone with Jesus. It's just coming away and getting alone and spending time, intimacy with Jesus, communion with Jesus. I tell you, it, 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 there's, there's so much. And it's going to come out uh, tonight as we're about to see, but it's, it's that that much needed perspective. You've heard that expression, you could be so close to the tree, you can't see the forest. You know, sometimes you just have to turn it off, walk away. And there's this reminder, and it comes by way of the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And <laughs> you'll forgive me for the simplicity of this, but it is simple. It's like Jesus saying, hey, did you forget? You're saved. Why are you stressing out? Why are you freaking out? Why are you so worried and so concerned about everything that is happening? You know, sometimes we, we live our lives like we're not saved, or we forget that we're saved, and that soon and very soon Jesus is coming, that trumpet's going to sound, and we're out of here. I can't wait. Well, let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our time tonight. Father in heaven, thank You. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the gift of eternal life. Thank You that for those of us who know You are born again of the Holy Spirit, are saved, that this world is not our home, our final destination, that soon and very soon we believe truly with all of our hearts that You're coming to take us out of this lost and dying world that seemingly waxes more and more evil with each passing day. Lord, we have before us a book in our Bibles that You deemed fit to include in the canon of Scripture as inspired and so there's certainly a reason, because we know that all Scripture is God-breathed and given to us. So Lord, it is our desire tonight that You would show to us what it is, that You would have us to see, that we would hear that which You would desire to speak to us, and Lord, that we would receive. And more importantly, that above all, our time together in Your Word, in this book, in this chapter, will have the much needed effect of drawing us closer to You, so as to experience that intimacy with You. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. All right, let's jump in. You ready? You sure? All right. Verse 1, we're okay so far. <laughs> the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. 
All right. Good start. Here's the thing. First Kings chapter 4 tells us that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. I bet you didn't know that. He was a songwriter. Oh, he wrote over 3,000 Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs contains some of those 3,000 Proverbs. But think about this. He wrote 1,005 songs. Interesting, right? And of all the 1,005 songs that Solomon wrote, God deemed it necessary and fit to include this one song of the 1,005 songs that he had written in our Bibles. Interesting. Um, That's why it's the uh, oftentimes referred to as the song of songs. Of all the songs, this is the song of songs. You know how we talk about this is the, the, what we refer to as we're going to talk about tonight. He's the King of Kings. This is the song of songs, the song of all songs. Verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine kind of need to have the music in the background. (laughs) I'm sorry for the reference. I think it's Barry White, you know, that deep voice. (laughs) Candlelight, you know, dim lights. Let him kiss me. Okay, pastor, you're... (laughs) Again, right out of the chute here. This is speaking of our intimacy with the Lord, and our love for the Lord. And the wine speaks of joy, and how it is that in the presence of the Lord, like Psalm 1611 says, in your presence, O Lord, is found fullness of joy. It is a, an unspeakable joy, a fullness of joy. It is a joy like no other, that intimacy with Him. There's a kiss on the cheek, but it's different than the kiss on the mouth. And that's what this speaks to. Verse 3, because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Okay, this speaks to the name, as we know, being the nature. And what she's saying is that just the mention of your name is a fragrant ointment, a soothing ointment, a calming ointment. Verse 4, draw me away. That's good. Those three words right there, draw me away, because I'm being drawn away by the world and everything that's going on in the world. I want to be drawn away with you, taken away from this. She says, we will run after you. The King has brought me into His chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I was thinking about James, where he writes that when we draw near to the Lord, He in turn draws near to us. But the prerequisite, if you will, is that we first draw near to Him. God will never force Himself on us. He will never demand that we get away and draw near to Him. Because then, if that were the case, it would go from being a get to, to a got to. Can you imagine? Just think about it in the context of a marriage relationship, or even the parenting relationship, the family dynamics. 
How would that be if your wife, husband, heard you say something to the effect of, oh, I need to spend time with you. Really? (laughs) Hey, don't bother. It's going to be like that. How is it with the Lord? You know, we talk about quiet time, our devotional time. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta spend time with the Lord. Can you, can you imagine? The Lord's like, no, I, I don't want it to be like that. I want it to be a want, not a need, not a have to. I want it to be a want to. I want it to be a get to, not a have to, not a got to. It's our move. And it's almost like a request, because she asks, draw me away. Almost a plea, if you want to see it like that. Oh Lord, I need to be with you. I want to spend time with you. Draw me away, take me away. I'll run after you. I'll seek hard after you as the deer pants for the water. So too does my soul pant and long after thee. It's the longing of our hearts to be with Him. There's that hunger, that thirst that only He can satiate. Oh, we can try in as much (laughs) as we think we can to fill that void, satisfy that hunger, that thirst, that longing in our souls. It only leaves us emptier, hungrier, thirstier. Verse 5 gets kind of interesting here. She says, I am dark, but lovely. (laughs) O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. What's she saying here? Well, you have to understand that in that day, it was not cool to have a tan like it is in our day. Because those that were tanned by the sun, darkened because of the sun, were the laborers, the peasants, the slaves. They're out in the sun all day, and as such they become dark and brown. And if you were not darkened and tanned by the sun, you were seen as, oh, they must be nobility, even royalty. And isn't it interesting that her response is, don't look at me. Don't look upon me. You know, she's in good company. I think of Isaiah, actually on Sunday for the prophecy update, unless the Lord shows me otherwise. I want to talk about Isaiah in chapter 6, a word fitly spoken, I believe, for where we're at today. It was in the year that King Uzziah died, and it shook Isaiah to the core, because he was a king, a godly king, one of only eight kings, that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He was a good king. And he reigned, get this, for 52 years. And his reign was marked by peace and prosperity and stability and calm under his righteous reign. And then he dies. And now here's Isaiah. What are we going to do? This is uh, kind of earth shaking. So he looks up, and what does he see? He sees the Lord seated on the throne, not pacing back and forth, wringing his hands, biting his nails before the throne. Could you imagine that? (laughs) What are we going to do? 
Lord, did you see what happened on Tuesday? No, what happened? Oh my goodness. What are we going to do? No, they're contesting. There's, there's the states and now they, 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 could you imagine? When did this happen? God, you're supposed to be all knowing. You'll forgive the silliness with which I illustrate this, but don't we act like that? Come on. Let's be honest with ourselves. After Tuesday, Tuesday night, we had our prayer meeting here, right? We go home. Really? (laughs) Wednesday morning, we wake up. Really? (laughs) I hope you understand that it's all downhill from here. Have a nice evening. So, Like Isaiah, it's, it has the potential to shake us to the core. And when he looks to the throne and sees the Lord seated on the throne, His robe just filling the temple, and it is just so overwhelming the holiness of God, that He just says, woe to me. Don't look at me. I am unclean. I have unclean lips, which is an interesting thing for Him to say. So a seraphim takes a coal from the altar and touches his lips and sanctifies his lips. But in the presence of the Lord, like her, she's, don't look upon me, get away from me. I'm not worthy. Peter did the same thing in the boat when he realized it was the Lord. He said, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. And then John on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation, in the presence of the Lord. He fell on his face as though dead. What's my point? My point is this. When you behold the glory of the Lord, it brings you to your face. It ruins you. It ruins you. It humbles you. Verse 7, Tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Uh, This verse here, verse 7, is one of the main reasons why I am choosing to teach this this way, because this king is also a shepherd. That's Jesus. He's our good shepherd. And He's also our King. Verse 8, If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock, and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. This has the idea of being a part of the flock of God, fed by God. Again, this is a love song. It's a love story. I think about when Jesus restored Peter, and He asked him three questions, because Peter had denied Jesus three times. And that was the, and he knew what Jesus was doing. And all three questions had to do with Peter's love for Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep. Why the emphasis on feeding the flock of God? Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. It is the word of life. 
Verse 9. Everybody okay so far? We've got one more verse, going to get a little bit gnarly, for lack of a better word. Verse 9, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. <laughs> Guys, listen, I would not recommend that you compare your wife to a horse. Just don't do that. I'm just saying. He's comparing her to a prized horse, a prized possession, this prized filly. And it speaks to, as we're going to see next, her value. And rightfully so, because in His eyes she is seen as so valuable, but in her eyes she's not worthy. Don't look upon me. Verse 10, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Please don't think that they pierced their cheeks and put in, you know, jewelry. That's, this was a, uh, they would wear these head bands that had, you know, the jewels that would hang down over their cheeks. You've probably seen pictures of that. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. We, interesting word, one has suggested, it's speaking of the Trinity, we. We will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. A lot of typology here. First of all, the gold, of course, speaks to divinity. And it also speaks to value. And it also speaks to how, like our faith, it's like gold that God purifies and makes more valuable. How? By subjecting it to intense heat, to bring to the surface all of the impurities. And then when the heat brings all of the impurities to the top, the goldsmith then takes and scrapes the dross off of it, and then he knows he has pure gold when he can see his image reflected in that gold. That is valuable. Dare I say priceless. That's just the gold. What about the silver? Oh, interesting. Silver is the metal of redemption. Do you see what's happening here? He is not only her shepherd and king, He's also her redeemer and her God, with the gold and the silver. Now verse 12, I believe a reference to the communion table. Understand that communion is to commune with, a common union. And to understand it in that culture is so important. We miss it in our day in this culture. You have to understand that when you break bread with somebody, you become one with that person. Because the idea is that bread that is in you is the same bread that's in me. It's a common union. We become one. So she says, while the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. Oh, she's going to dine with. Now she's already in the chamber, because He's taken her away at her request to be with Him, intimate with Him. And now she's at the table with Him, and it is fragrant. And again, this speaks to the communion table with our King of Kings. Verse 13, here it is. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. Okay, hang on. A uh, little bit too much information there, but we'll, we'll work with it. What's she saying here? Oh, close to my heart 
close to my heart, between my breasts. What's between your breasts? Oh, interesting, the bundle of myrrh. You know what the myrrh speaks of? You understand that, that myrrh was a burial spice. This was at a time before the modern day burial and, and how they embalm. And you know, it, it's back in that day, they only had these fragrant spices at the time of burial. You know what she's talking about here? The death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is what she is putting close to her heart, keeping close to her heart. And again, it speaks of love. And here's why. Because no greater love has any man than he laid down his life for another. You must really love me, because you died for me. Interesting too about myrrh. It's a spice, an, an herb that when, first of all, it's very bitter. But when you crush it, it releases a magnificent fragrance. I think about the church in the book of Revelation, the church of Smyrna one of only two of the seven churches for which there was no rebuke for the Lord. It's affectionately referred to as the persecuted church. The name is the nature, Smyrna, myrrh, bitter persecution, but when crushed, fragrant before the Lord. Verse 14, My beloved is to me, a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, for the benefit of those who have never been to Israel, uh, you have, it's one of those places you just have to see to believe. I mean, it's, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's very arid, very dry, very barren. It's there in the area of the Dead Sea. <laughs> But it is also an oasis of sorts, and it's a hideout. And in fact, it was where David hid when Saul was seeking after him to kill him. It was a safe place, an oasis, a place that you could run to and hide in and be safe in. And what she's saying is, you are like that oasis, that hiding place for me. Verse 15, his response, Behold, you are fair, my love. Now at first read one might think, fair? That's all I am? I'm just fair? Fair to Midland? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm just fair? No. If you only knew in the original language what this word means and what it would have meant, it, it's like this, you're ravishing. Is that too much? I hope not. You are, you are just, I mean, I'm going to stick with ravishing because I don't want to. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, thank you, pastor, so much, because that's good enough for me. That does it for me. Okay, ravishing. My love, my love. Ah, can I just go one step further? My lover, my lover. Oh, come on. Don't we sing and say, lover of my soul? He is our lover the lover of our soul. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. Oh, wait, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> Again, husbands, not necessarily um, something you want to say to your wife. You know, I'm looking at your eyes and you have dove's eyes. <gasps> How? It, guys, listen, 
it's kind of like when your wife comes up to you and says, do I look fat in this? <laughs> no, the right answer. No, of course not. I digress. You have dove size? What's this about? Oh, the dove is a type of the Holy Spirit, right? And what's the fruit, singular, of the Holy Spirit? Love. It's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. And he says of her, you are ravishing. And isn't it true that it's the woman's eyes that get you every time? And that's what he's saying. I look into your eyes. And by the way, you are ravishing. Your eyes captivating because of what I see in your eyes. Verse 16, Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Listen, wives, I just want you to know, you probably already know this, but maybe you need to be reminded of this. Your husband needs to hear this all the time. <laughs> no, for real. They need to hear it. Yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor My That ship sailed a long time ago. <laughs> oh, really? Also, being handsome and beauty, it's all outward. Uh, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when you did your vows, uh, w didn't you make a vow that in sickness and in health? I mean, <laughs> beauty is fleeting, and it's the inward beauty uh, you know, I probably, yeah, I think I will share this. I don't want to, you know, sometimes I go back and forth with the Holy Spirit, but sometimes it's a word fitly spoken. I think this is a word fitly spoken. So uh, my wife, uh, arguably, is uh, just, I mean, she is stunning. I, I remember one time somebody said to me, you know, your, your wife looks like Nicole Kidman. I said, no, she doesn't. Nicole Kidman looks like my wife. <laughs> you know, you learn, you learn these things over the years. You know, it took me a while, but I got it. <laughs> beautiful woman, beautiful woman, on the outside and the inside. When our daughter Noel died, her outward beauty meant nothing. It was her inward beauty that meant everything. I tell you, outward beauty is, I mean, <laughs> nothing wrong with the outward beauty. But if you're basing your relationship on that, it is a faulty foundation. And it's just a matter of time, because sooner or later, usually sooner, <laughs> I wish it was later, but you know, the guy's hair that he was, you know, when he was younger, so cool. I know I mentioned this last week. I have many requests now for pictures of me and my afro. I'm not even going to go there. You know, I have so much hair and I think now I don't because God was saying, well, that's what you get because I was really into my hair. So I don't know why I got back on the hair, but you know, the, the hair, if, if you still have it, it goes gray. And oh, by the way, uh, the face, you know, everything, it's called gravity, right? We talked about this. Everything just kind of, well, it goes south, literally. It, um, and the wrinkles, and you know, you just don't look like you did when you were younger, now that you're older. So, <laughs> but guys need to know that you have eyes only for them. And in your eyes, they're still handsome. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> they need to hear it. 
Don't even get me started on the wives, husbands. Reminds me of that story about the husband who never told his wife he loved her after they got married. And then finally she just, you know, couldn't take anymore. And she says to him, honey, you, you never say you love me. You never tell me you love me. To which he responds, hey, I told you I loved when we got married. That should be good enough. You know, in the book of Proverbs, one of the things that the earth cannot stand up under, there's, it's on a list, it's a wife who is not loved. The earth cannot stand up under that. Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. <laughs> you imagine that you come home at the end of the day, guys, and your wife's there to greet you. And she says, oh, there you are, handsome. Come on in. Our bed is green. What happened? <laughs> what, what did you do? What happened? What's this speaking of? It's speaking of peaceful rest. Peaceful rest. Think of it like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There shall be nothing I will ever want. And He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's where I'm fed. He sets the table before my enemies. He feeds me, but He also, notice, He has me lie down. Oh, I need, I need to lie down. I need that rest. And it has to be a peaceful rest. My rest is in Him. Come to me, Jesus would say, all you who are heavy laden, burden weary, battle weary, oh, and I will give you rest for your soul. And then verse 17, I mean it just ties a bow on the whole chapter at the end of the chapter. The beams of our houses are cedar, and our rafters of fir can't think of a better way to end the chapter and dovetail into partaking together of communion. I mean, it just fits so perfectly. You know what this is saying? The cedar beams, the rafters, they are so strong and stable. at a time in a day, on this night, when everything around us is anything but. The instability. I hesitate to say this, but, and maybe somebody here tonight or watching online was amongst those who didn't sleep very well Tuesday night. I'm sorry. I slept like a baby. <laughs> yeah, I cried all night like a baby. <laughs> but, I mean, I slept very well Tuesday night. Came home from the prayer meeting, oh my goodness, being with you, it was like, it was like the, the afterglow. I felt like Moses, you know, when he came down from the mount, and he didn't want the glow that was fading to be seen, that it was fading. So he covers, you know, the, the afterglow with the veil cover, covering his face because it was fading. I felt like that. I did, oh Lord, I don't want this to fade. I went home and my, my wife's like, uh, have, you, have you seen what's going on? No, I don't want to. Eh. <laughs> a 
Again, I, on Sunday morning, Lord willing, I want to talk about this in more detail. What now? What now? Well, I wonder. Because you've got to know that God allowed this, right? And I, I, I would venture to say that many of us were not surprised by this. We kind of sensed that something like this might happen. So we weren't totally blindsided by it. But I wonder, if this isn't God's way of saying, you need to lift up your eyes and look at me seated on the throne and take your eyes off of man. Because I'm seated on the throne. Stability, security. I, I mean, at the risk of uh, painting a perilous picture, <laughs> um, if the experts are right, and they very well could be, this is going to get really ugly. As the saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, for those of you who uh, remember the year 2000, it was one state, Florida. It lasted 37 days. What if what is about to happen makes that look like kindergarten? because I believe it will. Before you know it, it's going to be December, and before you know it, it's going to be January. And we don't have a president in the White House. Just like there was no king on the throne. Oh, but there is. He's seated on the throne. I just wonder, is this what it's going to take? Because if you really think about it, whatever it takes, right? I mean, the, the question has to be asked and answered, and I don't want to go too far into this, but I think it, it needs to be said. The question needs to be asked and answered, how much longer are we going to continue to hang on to this world not our home. I mean, I, I have to confess, and I've shared this before, and I'm just being very open with you on elections, presidential elections. I was devastated. And I went into a funk for weeks. I'm not exaggerating. That's not hyperbole. Not this time. In fact, my wife commented, she says, why are you so calm? So, uh, because, number one, I saw it coming. And number two, for the first time in my life, I'm not putting my hope in an election. Thank you for clapping. Man, you'd think I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit when you say stuff like that. Oh, good. Sunday's update. Ah, one more thing. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> Why not? Um, I brought up this issue of Christians being more unloving than non-Christians. And just the vitriolic, hate-filled social media posts, calling Democrats demon rats. How, how are you going to share Christ with them when you demonize them like that? And I brought up Hunter Biden. Here's a guy who has hit rock bottom. You know how humiliated that man is? And Christians are piling on 
with such arrogance, such haughtiness. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. So I basically said that, not quite like that. But all the comments, Pastor J.D. voted for Biden. (laughs) Pastor J.D. is pro-abortion. You know, at some point, and I I tell you, the the sooner the better, (laughs) because God is a jealous God, not of us, for us. And when we have other gods that we're putting our trust in. You know what's interesting? Isaiah, it was when King Uzziah died that he looked up, not before. Sometimes I think our King Uzziah has to die, whatever that King Uzziah is. That King that is seated on the throne of our lives. And it's then and only then that we look up. And I wonder, lastly, okay, for sure, lastly, (laughs) I wonder if it's not the Lord, just hear my heart please on this. I wonder if this isn't the Lord saying, uh, what are you going to rest on and rest in now. The foundations have been shaken, the throne unsettled. Why don't you look to me? This is really uncertain. I'm not. This is really unstable. I'm not. (laughs) This is really scary. Well, I'm not. Is this what it's going to take? Is this what it's going to take? Okay, this will be the last thing. It just came to me. You know, we were talking about Elijah on Sunday. And it kind of hit me. I've still just kind of been struck by the whole Elijah thing and how he was upset with God, because God didn't drain the swamp of Ahab, and He didn't lock her up with Jezebel, and He fully thought that there would be national revival and repentance, and that He would make Israel great again. And it didn't happen. But you know what did happen? Oh, He was raptured up to heaven the chariot and horses of fire. So stay with me on this. I wonder if God would have went to Elijah prior and gave him a choice. Said, okay, Elijah, here's the deal. It's your choice. You can either make Israel great again, drain the swamp, lock her up. You can have all that behind door number one, or Behind door number two, oh, check out this chariot over here <laughs> and the horses. And oh, by the way, Elijah, I know you like fire. I got fire, lots of fire. I want to take you to heaven. Look, where I come from, they call that a no brainer. I wonder if that's the question before us today. Do you want four more years? Make America great again. Lock her up. Drain the swamp. You can fill in all the rest of them. Or behind door number two. Oh, I, that's not even a, that's not even a question. There's no choice. I mean, that's not even really, that's, come on, that's a no-brainer, that's a slam dunk. Can I say it like that? I just did. It's a slam dunk. As we 
tonight partake together of communion. One of the things that I really sense the Lord would have us to do is to come back to the simplicity of intimacy with the Lord. Because when you do, none of that matters. It's that hymn, I referred to it on Sunday. I love it so much. It says it best. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I'll tell you, you come away with Him, you commune with Him, you have intimacy with Him. None of it matters. In Luke's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, I'll begin reading in verse 14. It's the account of what we affectionately refer to as the Last Supper. Jesus has just got done telling His disciples that He's going to be crucified. They were having a hard time with it, especially Peter. And it had come now time to celebrate the Passover, which was huge, still is the Passover, the feast of the Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits, all of which are a type of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the Passover prophecy, the feast of unleavened bread in His burial, and the first fruits in His resurrection, the first fruits of His resurrection. And that's what the Passover celebration was. So that time had come. And he knows, and he's going to tell them that this will be the last time that we break bread together and partake together and celebrate the Passover together. He even takes it further and says, the next time we do this will be in my, my Father's house, in my kingdom, when this finds its ultimate fulfillment. He says it no less than two times here. Verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, Then he said to them, here it is, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, second time, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Real quick. Why is it that Jesus wanted us to do this in remembrance of Him? Because we forget we forget. And we live our lives like He's not coming back. That there's not coming a time when we're going to be with Him in His kingdom, when this is fulfilled. Listen, wrap your mind around this in as much as you're able. What we're about to do here tonight, we are going to do with Him at His table in His kingdom. Just try to I know it's not possible in the finite to comprehend the infinite, but what we're doing here tonight, one day, soon and very soon, we're going to be doing with Him at His table. Now, what was your problem here on earth again? I don't mean to be so blunt, but I think you get the point, right? That's why we're to remember, oh yeah, man, what am I getting so worked up for? (laughs) I remember now. And it changes everything. 
And Luke writes, verse 19, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take the packaging, those of you that are here and online, if you get the bread and just take and hold on to it for a moment. We hold in our hands a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. Not His bones, His body, His skin was broken so His blood could be shed. And that was a requirement for the Passover prophecy. No bones of the Passover lamb could be broken, only the skin, the body. Uh, Interesting, when we get to the cup, His body was broken, His skin was broken, His, His blood shed from seven places on His body, seven the number of completion. How appropriate. It is completed. It is finished. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Seven, both of His feet, both of His hands, His back when He was whipped, the crown of thorns on His head. And by the way, don't, don't picture those thorns as little, you know, rose bush or, you know, what's that? Uh, my, oh, my wife has bougainvilleas. Oh, I hate it when she makes me trim them. Because I just, those, those thorns, they just lacerate and, you know. Anyway, I digress. But we're talking thorns, man. These things were just, I mean, sharp and long. And they were, they were plunged into his head, that crown of thorns. And the seventh and final place was when the Roman guard plunged his sword into the side of the Savior, and out came blood and water. By the way, the two birthing elements, the two elements present at birth. And it came from His side as the second and final Adam, just as God created Eve from the rib from Adam's side. So too was the birth of the bride from the side of the Savior, the second and final Adam. I love typology. Seven, the number of completion. His body was broken for us instead of us. Would you partake with me? Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you. Hmm. Once again, seems so inadequate. Lord, we cannot thank You enough for what You did and for giving us this to do in remembrance of You. We too, Lord, fervently desire, eagerly await that day when what we're doing here tonight finds its fulfillment in Your kingdom. And Lord, we truly believe that that day is very soon. So Lord, thank you. Luke goes on to write, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, and this is important, is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Again, if you'll take the packaging and peel back the remainder of it, and again, just hold on to it. I don't know if it's possible to overstate the profound importance of the symbol that we hold in our hands, the symbol of the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood, we say, we sing. It's this blood, a symbol of the blood of the new covenant that is so powerful that it removes our sins, 
as far as the east is from the west, and God remembers them no more. And though our sins were as scarlet, He makes them white as snow. That's how powerful it is. And here's the thing. There's no remission of sin, remission of sin, without the shedding of blood. Uh, It's His blood, His shed blood, that pays in full for all of our sin. (laughs) Past, present, and even yet future. That's how powerful His blood shed is. Would you partake with me? And once you do, please stand. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Lord, I pray, and you know my heart, and you see every heart of everyone here and everyone watching online. My prayer is that tonight something will have changed in our lives, in our relationship with you. That tonight, as we leave this place and make our way home, that there's no turning back. The cross before us, the world behind us, no turning back, no turning back. Lord, You've really spoiled us for You. You've ruined us for anything else, certainly anything this world has to offer. We've tasted of You, Lord, and we've seen that You are good. And tonight was just a foretaste of what's to come. And Lord, I pray that it will have the much needed effect of getting us to let go of this world and the things of this world, that we would draw near to You, press into You, look to You. Lord, thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.